Uh, my name is Julio Cesar Osorio. Uh, I mean, to, to begin with, uh, that's quite a name that I had to kind of, uh, that was given, Julio Cesar. Hello and welcome to Obehi Podcast. I'm your host, Obehi A14, and I strongly believe that everyone has a story to share. Now let's get started with this episode. Uh, obviously, my parents had a, a big vision of, of of what I was going to be. I guess um, I was in Colombia, in a small small town called Calarca, which is like a, a very um, it's at the north uh, of of Colombia, so it's right at the beginning of where the Andes begin. Uh, so it's, it's it's quite a an important town because from one part of Colombia to go to, to the capital and, and, you know, from the valley where the sugar and tobacco and all that kind of thing, everything has to be transported going through my town. So just just recently it expanded and, uh, you know, there was very small roads carved to the to the mountains, but now they, there's a massive project that's been underway and they've made some channels through the actual mountain. So and really massive. I think I think it's been done by by a French company or something, but it's massive. So a lot more movement and stuff. It's a very key point in, in uh, for the transport and uh, all the goods that go through Colombia. Um, what else can I say? I came to to England uh, to join my father uh, and my mum. Uh, well, my stepmother, but she's now she's been like my mum uh, when I was twelve in nineteen eighty three. So. It's, is coming up to 40 years and um and I'm, I'm forever grateful because uh li- i live in england and and I've, I've managed to study and do many things that unfortunately third world countries uh, you know uh, you are you are we are limited if you don't have money you are limited to study you are limited it's not impossible but uh but it's very difficult and uh, you know that's 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 kind of where we got. Do you want to uh, talk also? Uh, what you concentrate your time on? I mean, what do you do today? What what is your what? Is, tell me about your profession or currently assistance. Well, um, I was gonna go into that. I mean, I have always been an entrepreneur. I had a few businesses. I mean, I set up my first business when I was twenty one, uh, which was the first Latin American. Uh, uh, Restaurant in the south of London now is where the biggest community of uh, Colombians and Latin Americans live. Um, but then at 21, and then I got fed up because uh, well, I just got fed up and just uh, went traveling. And then I, I, I came back at 27 and I wanted to back to go back to studying. And I, I decided to do, I did a degree on, um, on photography and digital imaging with the aim to, you know, make films one day. We believe that everyone has a story to share. We believe in the power of storytelling in today's digital economy. Yes, we believe that our audience need to be touched at the level of emotion so we can better engage. What about you? Do you believe in storytelling as much as we do? Do you want to reach the hearts and minds of your audience? Then join us in our online training class storytelling for content creators and digital entrepreneurs come come to obehi a14.com slash storytelling and learn how to leverage your storytelling skills so you can earn more as a content creator and digital entrepreneur storytelling is a powerful instrument at our disposal let's explore it together see you in the class At the present time, I well after after I graduated, I devoted to to uh, photojournalism because that that that's kind of once also one of my passions. Again, we go back to the fact that it's is uh, the world we live in. I kind of don't really understand why there's so much unfairness and so much you know there's such a divide between. The wealthy and the and the especially in third world countries, the wealthy and the 
and the great, you know, working class, um, which is the, you know, the biggest uh, percentage of, of the population. And I wanted to to record, document, expose uh, things that, you know, are important to me. And that's what I did, really, uh, for, for quite some years. Um, it was only recently that, uh, about 10 years ago, that uh, I had a studio. I kind of went, moved on to commercial photography, and I had set up a studio. And, um, and unfortunately, um, two years down the line from that, um, one day after work, um, I went, you know, to my local bar and um, go into an application with a with a with a doorman, which I knew. But the guy, obviously, um, there's people that I, I, I put it down to envy. I don't know. I'm I'm a very happy-go-lucky person, and some people don't like that kind of thing. Uh, the the I can't remember his exact name, but anyway, he was he was from Nigeria, um, and he picked on me, and you know, he got to the point where he actually threw me on the floor and, and I uh, I ended up retaliating and I ended up in prison for that, uh, for two and a half years. And it was there in prison that, uh, you know, my camera had been taken away. Um, uh, after, a, after a month, you know, in, in lockdown, because, you know, it takes that, 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 that time if you want to study, you know, to, to, for, to, to get into the system. Um, and uh, I went to an art class, and that was my first, you know, kind of time away from myself. Um, and he, I just, you know, we were taught to paint. I didn't know how to, I, I'd never painted before. I never thought I could paint. Um, and I mean, I'm very good friends with the teachers, all the teachers from, from, from prison, because from that day, she just said, paint something. Her name is Lisa Hendricks. And she said, well, just come in and paint. And say, well, well why do we paint? And she said, paint anything. And I was just like, I can't paint. I don't know. And she said, well, look, Julio, just to take it easy. Have a look through those uh, books, you know, the art books with great masters or whatever. See something that you like and try and copy it. And uh, and I did. And I just found this this lovely painting by a Dutch painter. I can't even remember his name. Of a beach. And I thought, oh, I'd love to be there. Um, I basically I copied it, and within an hour I, I produced my first ever painting. Uh, I forgot where I was, and I not only that, when I looked back, at, when I looked at the at the painting, I thought, "Wow, <laughs> I can paint." It just it, it was just like a, a, an illumination because I just thought, "Wow, I never thought I could paint." And from that day onwards, I um, that's what I did for two and a half years. I taught myself practice and blah, blah. and now for the past 10 years that's what I've been doing uh, painting and um, so much so that again um, you can see part of, of one of my paintings the biggest painting that I've um, that I've done so far and that was um, a one when I when I came out, came out of prison after two and a half years I won a, I was given a scholarship um, and and a mentor you know another artist that meant to me and I was giving some money to to do a project, and I said, "Well, what I want to do is basically a big, a big painting, the biggest I have done, because you couldn't do anything larger than one meter in prison." Um, and this is what I produced. It's called Class Act. Uh, shame you can't see the rest, but uh, we can. We can. Put, it's basically it's, it's about the class system. It's it's just animals, which is is basically we got a lion. With his working behind the bar, they're in a bar basically. We got a lion, we got a um, an elephant, and a mouse. I mean, I wish I could. Uh, should I try and we not gonna move the camera because it just makes it. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Go ahead. We're we're here for you. All right. Okay. Look. Uh, let me see. Is can you see it now? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. We can see it. All yeah. right. Well, basically, the lion is working behind the bar. The, the elephant is pouring champagne and on his task there's a little mouse hanging uh, being being spoiled with champagne <laughs> and that's that I, I, that I frame I called the class class act and the reason for that is because I just thought society is so you know there's the hierarchy that that man has created and it's obviously the wealthy that have created this hierarchy that you know the king of the the, the more money you have you, you, but the king of the jungle is the elephant uh so and and with with um 
with this status of, of king and, and what have you, then they're the people that champagne and what have you. And I say, well, really, no, the king of the jungle, people say, is the, is the lion, but it's, it's not true because the elephant is the king of the jungle. No lion, you never see lions attacking elephants because they know best, you know? Uh, but yet elephants are afraid of mice. And so I thought, well, let's just, why can't we just like, the, mankind has created this, this thing, you know, the kings and queens and, and what have you. Um, why can't we just turn it around and say, okay, the king of the jungle is working behind the bar. There's nothing wrong about working behind the bar, you know. Uh, just So you only work behind the bar if you pour, if you, you, you understand. You, you, you can only, you're limited to what you can do in, in, in jobs and what have you. Anyway, the king of the jungle, I think, is the elephant because no, no lions even attack an elephant. But he's afraid of mice, which are little things like this. I thought, well, let's just, the king of the jungle just having champagne with the elephant and the, and the, the lion behind them. It's called class act. So, yeah. What inspired you to uh, do this work? Because I, I find it to be very interesting and also significant, no? Well, it is. Uh, it is significant. Like I said, it, it's about the class system, you know? Uh -huh. About man, society itself, how man has created it, I think. Um, again, you know, the hierarchy, you know, the more wealthy you are, then you, the, you have a status, you know? But you don't have to have a, t a status. Um, that would bring me into, into the, my next project that I'm doing. I discovered this lady, um, Lihia, her name is, uh, on my last trip to Colombia. And she, I, I stumbled across her uh, with a little shop, and she's got this. And I walked in there, and it was like a treasure trove, you know? She works with leather. She's a you know, craft, crafts um, woman, if you like, an artisan. And I. I and she told me a story just a few days ago because, I, anyway, I brought lots of examples of what she was selling and stuff because I thought, wow, those creations are, are beautiful. Um, I'm going to get them, you know, to, to, to I'm going to do her a favor and do myself a favor, you know. It's a, I think it's a, it's a great thing that needs to be shown, you know, sell, sold to the world. Um, and she just told me a story just that, because I, I've been rushing around, you know, doing so many things. Um, she told me a story two days ago. And basically, she grew up on the streets of the same town that, that I did. Uh, as a poor, as a poor person, you know, on the streets. And you still get that street children, you know, poor, poor countries have street children. And I just think, you know, when you go to countries that are so wealthy, when you go to people that are so wealthy, even back, back home, um, how could people walk past and see someone sleeping in the streets without trying to do something? To help them to you know better themselves maybe giving some education or you know to try and do anything but that's just the way it is mankind is like humanity is lost i think no not everyone has lost it but you know wealth and money makes people think like that um anyway she told me she grew up on the streets and she taught herself how to work with leather, um, with leather. Uh, and she's now oops Oh, I thought I lost you. Uh, and she's now creating these beautiful pieces, and and we <clears throat> we are on the process of uh, of launching the brand worldwide. I'm on the process of doing that because she, she, I got, I got the, the 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 connections and the willpower to do it because what she's doing is going to employ so many people. She works with a group of uh, single parents. Uh, families in Colombia that we don't have a, a social security system so you know they, a lot of people struggle to even find work you know uh, so we're gonna we're gonna set up a big um, manufacturing place so that these people can come and work and produce these beautiful things with her uh, also she works with a group of uh, artisans and most artisans um, well not most but a lot of them are again people that have not been able to study, people that, you know, the creatives that, you know, in those circumstances can do it, can do things. Uh, she works with um, disabled, disabled, partly disabled people, again, to give them employment. And but last, uh, indigenous communities, which are very much picked on. Um, and again, the class system, it makes me angry because the class system, 
even in Colombia, just kind of put them to the side. I mean, they're the, they are the, the, the original people of South America, and yet they're kind of seen as second, second class citizens. And last but not least, uh, a group of um, young and old people that are on rehabilitation from drugs and, and, and what have you. And we're going to get all these people together uh, and we're going to get them and give them employment and and make the people conscious that what they're buying, they are contributing to the well-being and of, this, of all these groups of people that otherwise people put aside. So, yeah, um, I mean, I'm on a passion. And that brings us to, to, to what we were talking about. It brings us back to what we were going to talk about. This is my book. My book is called Work, Play, and No Rest. Uh, and that's my name. Dun, 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 dun. Julio Cesar Osorio. <laughs> Basically, this book <clears throat> is about... This, this, is a, this book is about... That's... Let me see. Okay. Oops. Camera. All right. See my thoughts on Jacqueline and my son Daniel. But the past that you make be the ones that leave trails. And that's my 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 that my son's little fur and mine. Right, this book started as a, when I was at uni, a university doing my, my degree on photography. Um my mother became ill. Um, she with the discovered she had cancer. She lived there with me for a while, uh, and unfortunately, she had cancer. And she 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 wanted to go back to Colombia because she thought that she didn't want to die here. I mean, it, it was a uh, it, it wasn't treatable. You know, she had lung cancer, um, and so she had to go. And here's here's my doggy. Come on, Um that's my, my new son. You have your company there. Yes, yes, but <laughs> he's my new son. Um, he's beautiful. He's a rescue as well. He used to be in the streets of Romania, and now he's the king of the castle. Uh, <laughs> so um, basically, yeah, so my mother was diagnosed with cancer, and she had to go back to Colombia. But she decided that she wasn't going to be here for, for that time. Um, so uh, it was my first year of uni, this is quite an important thing as well, so you can read it while I, while I, uh, this is the steps, <coughs> oops, other way around. This is called the ladder. It's a shame you can't see it. Okay. Yeah, yeah I can see it. I can see it. Yeah. Right, you can, you can really well talk about it. Do you know that telling a story is one of the most powerful ways to connect with your audience? Do you know that the human brain processes story much more easily are quickly than facts and figure. Stories are a great way to engage your audience, get them interested in your products and services, and inspire them to take action. A good story will help you create more compelling content that can be shared on social media or through other channels. And it's not just about telling a compelling story, it's also about knowing how to tell it effectively. Now, do you want to better connect with your audience? Then join us on our online training class, Storytelling for Content Creators and Digital Entrepreneurs. Come to obehim slash storytelling and learn how to leverage your storytelling skill to earn more as a content creator and digital entrepreneur. Storytelling is a powerful way to connect with your audience. So let's explore it together. See you in the class. This is the ladder that you're supposed to. This was taken from a, a, a wall in Colombia of where my brother was because he, he after my mother died, he was um, he went into drugs and and we took him to a rehab place, and this is what they had in the wall, you know, and I translated it because I thought that's the steps to to bettering yourself in any in any situation. All right. While you continue that story, I have a curiosity. Yeah. Uh, how does your uh, background in Colombia affect or influence 
uh, the kind of story you tell and how you work with your with your with your artwork. Oh, I tell I tell you how it does because it's it's one of my life story. You know, my parents uh, separated when I was five years old. Uh, again, this is um, I think that's that's kind of what made me who I am. Um, my father's family were quite wealthy. Um, and my father met my mother, my my, sad, my mother's side of the family were not wealthy at all, but they, he fell in love with her and um, and he had two kids. My father's family never kind of um, approved of, of the relationship because again, we go back to the same thing about this hierarchy, um, which makes me angry anyway. Um, and so my father, Apparently, he told me the story. He asked my, my granddad to, to borrow his money to, to buy a, a home, you know, for, for me, for, for our family. And my, fra- my grandfather uh, denied it. He said, no, he wouldn't, that, you know, she work. So my father was working for my, for my dad um, since the age about, I, I think he said about 10 or so. Or so. Um, and all of a sudden, the, the opportunity in 75, opportunity came for him to, um, they were giving um, working working visas in Europe and stuff, and, he, and, and a whole, and people were just coming, immigrating to, to, to Europe from Colombia. Usually it was the States, but no, this, this was a thing to Europe. And my dad just jumped to the opportunity. He left my mother. You know, supposedly to be loved, looked after by my grandparents. You know, my my father's son, because my grandmother couldn't look after. They were poor, um, and basically, my my brother was only about six months old. Um, and then, as soon as he came, my mother made sure that she showed me that, you know, to begin with, they were bringing you know food and stuff for us. But then he kind of went down, 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 and and until the my um, mother had to kind of go. I remember the story of um, my mother saying to me, look, Julio, I can't, look. I mean, I was five, but I remember. She said, look, this is, the, we, we don't have, they're not bringing, like to show me that the, the food kind of started, rations started to go down, you know. Um, <clears throat> I remember one day, my, my dad's family t- uh, took, to the courts, basically, to the, the family courts, to get custody of me and my brother, legally, obviously, because they could afford it. Um, my mum couldn't. Uh, I remember one day, I think it was a final hearing, I, I went with my mother and my granddad. Uh, we, we were going to go to the hearing. I was about six, maybe. I don't know. I can't remember. I was very young. Uh, and we went to a cafeteria, and my father said to me, uh, "Am I, it's not my father, my grand." that said to me, look, we're going to go to a place. I mean, I could see him talking with my mama. I could see she was upset. And, and I, I could hear the conversation. I said, are you going to be going to like a special place? And they're going to ask you, obviously, they're going to, because I was the eldest, they're going to ask you, who do you want to go and live with? Um, and uh, and you, you have to say that you want to come and live with your brother and your uh, grandparents, you know? And I said no, but I want to go and live. With my, I want to live with my mum. Obviously, I need my mum. I don't. I don't want to leave my mum. And basically, they say no, no, no. But you have to. And my mum, I started crying and stuff. And my mum said no, no, Julio. She's trying to, you know, comfort me. I say no, babe. But I can, I can come and see you. But you, go, you're gonna to have to say that. And I kind of agreed because my mum, I could see my mum was getting upset. Um, and when we went to the to the to the family to the family court and I was asked to to go and you know um and they asked me who do I wanted to go and live with and I said no my mom and but my mom and my brother uh which you know I could took it by surprise uh anyway the judge uh gave custody to the to my grandparents mm. and and that night I remember going to um but I started crying I said I'm not gonna leave and you know my mother and stuff um and my mom said listen can I Tonight, at least, can I can you stay with me? You know, we're staying just around the corner with some friends of my mother, from from my grandparents. My brother had already been taken by them anyway. Um, and that night, I remember just kind of crying and crying, and I said to my mum, "I don't want you to leave me." And and she said, "Well, you know, she could see the desperation in me." I remember 
we didn't go to to sleep that night and about i don't know it was it was dark it was late at night and we we just got together we got out of the house and we went and took a bus and we we left them you know i didn't go and leave at which point i went to live with my grand, grandmother in a farm she lived in a farm somewhere and I, and that's what um but my brother couldn't uh, he was with them. So he grew up with them. He's now a very, very um, bitter. And we're having a dispute anyway, because my father passed away and he now wants to... He's, he was very money-orientated because he grew up with my with my grandparents. He's actually even tried to um, to steal the, my, my, my father's inheritance, uh, which um, I'm, I'm fighting because that's not, that's not going to be the case. You know, he's going to end up in trouble now as well because he's been investigated for fraud with my father's credit cards and stuff. But you you look for your, for you know, life is like that. If you look for trouble, if you greed, you know, some, see, let's see who's going to fall. I'm not falling because when, with my, with I, I don't do things like that. Thank you so much for that, uh, Julia. That is very important. And you will see here uh, on that written, everyone has a story to share. Yeah. We're really passionate about it. We like to share the, the story of people because that is how we connect as human beings. Uh, apart from uh, maybe all the experiences that we have gotten in life, uh, until we are able to share this story, we cannot connect with people. So I really appreciate that. Well, no, thank you for having me. I think uh, we, we could just go back now to the, to the, to the actual, um, how the book started. So I was at university my first year, my mother was, was diagnosed with cancer. And I, and I said, I went to the tutors and said, look, my mother is terminally ill. All of a sudden, we were talking on every day on the phone. And all of a sudden, I could see that she, could, she wasn't making, she wasn't getting coherent uh, conversation. I said, I have to go. I can see my mum sleeping away. I can he, I can see my mum sleeping away, so I'm gonna to have to go to Colombia. And say, well, you, how long for? And I said, I don't know, but I, I'm gonna to go to Colombia. And they said, well, you can't do that if you, if you're here at, at university. I said, look, I can because I'm going to. So all, I, all I want you to do is, is like because obviously you got, you got assignments and stuff to do, and it was a photogra photography course, you know. So, <clears throat> so I said, okay, give me the assignments. I will do them in Colombia. And um, and that was it. One of the assignments was uh, well, you, you choose your project what to do. And I and, and I thought, well, I'm gonna be there for for some weeks, maybe months. <clears throat> I'm gonna go and do um, an assignment about my childhood, about children, you know, living in because I was on my spending the time with my grand, you know, my grandmother and my mother. They were the how I grew up, very humbly, you know. I thought, well, what, that's that's the best time to, to just document how I remember growing, you know, humbly. I never went hungry, thank God. Thank God. But uh, you know, not with all this material happiness that they try to sell you, you know. And I just thought we used to, you know, we never had a football, and we used to get together all the kids from 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 the area. <clears throat> we used to get plastic bags and get a piece of a stone and get plastic bags and run, wrap this piece of stone and make a football so it had some weight on it and stuff. And we used to play with that, you know. And we used to have fun, you know, just getting all the plastic bags and putting up foot, football together, you know. We learned to, I learned to, to ride a bicycle. But we, some, someone had a bike, but the bike had no, no frame, no um, brakes. <clears throat> and we used to go, we live in a little downhill bit. And uh, everyone, we used to, it was so high, it wasn't even a kid's bike, it was one of those rally bikes. And we used to climb to the side of the bike, <laughs> through the frame, and we used to go down the hill and then jump at the bottom of the hill uh, onto the grass because we didn't have any brakes. You know, it doesn't matter, but I remember having a, a great time and I thought I wanted to document that. And that's what this project started. It's called Work, Play and No Rest. It's about childhood in third world countries and about, <clears throat> I wanted to document the beauty of, of being a kid, even though you're poor, doesn't mean that you have to. This is this is a pain. Uh, this was taken at a township in South Africa, go called uh, Guguleto, and these are kids. Just look look at the little huts where they live. But you know you can see they got no shoes. They got but they got um, they got happiness. You know. This again is in the township of South Africa. 
the beauty and the innocence of being a kid, I think that's something that captured me and something that I experienced. This one is a really good one. Look, this is in Mexico. <clears throat> and that is a little is the little library. And I just saw how cute is that? And there's a kid sitting at, at the at the entrance of the library. And and you know, obviously someone need saw the importance of of, of a library uh, in those kind of again again working kids, you know. <clears throat> Um, that's why it's called work, play, and arrest, because a lot of these kids have to work, you know, and no other choice, but that's what they, that's what they do. This is in Colombia, a kid helping him, his mum. So I went, anyway, so that's how the project started. I went to document the kids. Um, I'll show you a few more as we go along. Um, <clears throat> and, and so I started in Colombia, two blocks of photographs at the time. <clears throat> We didn't have digital cameras, so a lot of them were shot with the film. Um, and um, and that's when it, it started. I mean, it rolled on to about five years because uh, from Colombia. Apparently, uh, unfortunately, my mother passed away, and I came back to uni. Only about three, it was it was only about three weeks when I was there that she passed away, and so it was time to come back, and I came back to. To, to uni and and then I went to uh, South Africa and then I went to Mexico. Uh, this is all funded by myself. Um, and then I went to uh, Venezuela, uh, again to Colombia, and and I just compiled all this, all this, um, all this. I mean, this this is a really good good picture actually. Um, again, this is in South Africa. You can see the kid hiding away, and the reason why he's hiding away. Is that when I went to even I had a very good friend in um, in South Africa, and she was um, she was my co um, co worker in this project. I went to visit her in South Africa. Her name is Lisette de Mendoza, uh, and she she never been to a township. I went to her for her father's uh, her brother's wedding. You know they 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 live very comfortably, basically, in Cape Town. Um, yet uh, I said to her, "Okay, I want to go. I want to go to the townships." And she said, "No, you can't go to the township." This was in, uh, I think, nine, uh, not ninety, ten thousand and eight, seven, something like that. Um, uh, apartheid had, you know, not been over that long. Obviously, the poverty and stuff in the in the townships is something else. And she said, "No, you can't go. You can't go there." And I said, "Of course, I can go there. Look at that." It, it reminded me of uh, this is in, in an island in Juan Chaco is called in Colombia, and this kid is playing with a plastic bag and just pouring sand into the plastic bag and she's having a whale of a time, you know, with this little plastic bag and that that's her toy, and she's content, so she doesn't need a a, a game box or a something to she probably will work out more things by doing that than by playing in a or watching uh, the Disney Channel. Um, so anyway, my friend said, no, you can't go to, to the townships. It's dangerous and stuff. Uh, I'm not taking you. And I said, well, I didn't tell you. You, you, you have to take me. I went out uh, in Cape Town by myself. And she said, you can't go by yourself. I said, I can do anything I want. And I actually said, give me your address, because I don't know the area. But give me your address. I'm going to drop me off into town. And then I'll see you tomorrow or something. Or I'll see you later on. Anyway, on the way back, I went, you know, exploring and uh, and on the way back, I took a taxi and I told the, the taxi driver, he was, he was, uh, what's he called? Oh, he mixed race or whatever. And I explained to him about the project. I said, I want to go to townships and, and photograph the kids in townships. And he said, no, that's dangerous. Even he said, that's dangerous. You can't go. And I said, listen. Why does everyone keep saying that it's dangerous? Um, I want to go to the townships. Will you take me there or do you know anyone that would take me to a township? Or give me the, some names. So I'll find a way to go to the townships. And, and basically he said, I gave him my number and I said, well, if you, if you can think of someone, give, please give me a call. He called me the four, two days after and he said, you know, about, I've been thinking about what you project and what you're doing and I will take you to the township. 
Uh, and we did. And he took me. And I, when I told my friend that so I had found someone that was going to take me to a township, she was like, oh, no, nah, the whole family, no. Nah. And I just said, well, I'm going to the township. Simple. And basically, um, I, and she said, well, can I come with you? And I said, of course you can come with me. You've been here 27 years or whatever, and you've never been to the township. Of course you can come with me. And we went to the township. I made. I took it. I bought some bags of sweets and, and and just little sweets and stuff. I think biscuits and stuff to give to the kids because I thought that's something they probably don't don't know ever had. And I just went to give them a little something, and I did. We stopped at the township. I got to I got um, to a certain point. Obviously, I, I couldn't. This place, if you don't know your way around, you can't really just because you get I'll get lost. Um, even some of the people there get lost. If you, you know, it's, they're such big communities. Anyway, when, when and for, started photographing the kids, some people were, they didn't even speak English like the adults, which I thought that was quite, quite bizarre. Um, but they were asking, what, what was I doing? And, I, and I, I tried to explain that I was doing a project about the children. I was giving them sweets and they were, oh, okay, good. Like, you know, everyone, uh, was agree with it. I took photographs and stuff. Anyway, this kid that I showed you before that was hiding. Um, uh, as a photojournalist, obviously, I don't, I don't ask for permission to take photographs. I take the photographs. To be a great content creator in today's fast-changing economy, you need one thing, storytelling. Storytelling is a powerful instrument to leverage, either for personal use or for your business success. This is why this training class, Storytelling for Content Creator and Digital Entrepreneurs, was created. It is designed to help you leverage the power of storytelling so you can stand out from the crowd and earn more in your business. Come to obehiair14.com slash storytelling and learn how to leverage your storytelling skill to earn more as a content creator and digital entrepreneur. You need the power of storytelling to stand out in the competition. So let's explore it together. See you in the class. And then if anything happens, we'll, we'll, we'll deal with it. But, <clears throat> but obviously I want to capture moments. Otherwise posing is, is, is a made up moment. Anyway, this kid, I'm photographing the kids, da, 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 I'm photo and I saw him, and then as soon as he saw me, he ran away. And I just kind of like followed him a bit, da, 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 and he went, and then that's when he popped his head around. And I asked one of the, with the taxi, I'm still with the taxi driver, and, and, and I said to him, please ask, why is he running? And then he asked one of the adults, you know, that was around, that why was he running away? And he just said he had, he's running away because he's scared, because he's never seen a white man here be, like before. He's never seen a white man before. And I thought, well, I wouldn't call myself white to begin with, but uh, I can understand he was afraid because no one goes to the townships, no one cares. Well, at that time anyway, now I think that, that, that you know, that things have changed a little bit more. Anyway, that was the story about that. And every, every picture's got a story. You see, uh, it is a story that actually humanizes uh, the object or the thing that we see in front of us. It is when we tell the story that it begins to have value. Otherwise, it's just another object there. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, again, this this was uh, this was in Mexico in one, mm -hmm. and this one was in Colombia. Look, they're playing with a little empty can and throwing some uh, uh, little rocks, filling the up and the stuff. They were this one. They were li no, sorry, this one. They were living on a on a shelter in Colombia after a massive earthquake, and I went to visit. And my uncle, my lovely favorite uncle, he he was a very community-driven man, uh, and I, he passed away just six months after my father passed away uh, three years ago, unfortunately. But I think I also adopted a lot about him because um, yeah, he used to that run a lot of community projects and stuff. Um, this one's quite interesting. Um, this one. I don't know if you can spot it. There's two. Did you see a pile of clothes and merchandise? This, uh -huh. These both are taken in Mexico. But if you spot them, there's two kids laying. There's one kid here. 
And there's a kid. Uh, where's the other kid? Uh, the other kid is here. Uh, yeah. They are the middle. Um, again, these kids are growing with parents that, you know, that's, that's going to be the livelihood, but at least the parents can work and stuff. Um, this one is quite good. One. This is from, from Colombia. A little guy with his drum <laughs> on the beach of Cartagena, Colombia. All right. Now, um, between what you saw in South Africa yeah. and uh, what you see in Colombia, uh, your country, what kind of similarity do you see uh, oh, uh, when you meet the people there? Tell me more about that. I'll tell you what, humanity in those poor, in poor countries is it, it's, it's, it's a very mixed bag because, you know, when people struggle and stuff, they become more community driven. At, at the same time, it's also very... Um, you can't explain it if you grow in poverty and you see the difference, you know, you might see the TV and all the people in cars and stuff and you think, well, why do, why can we not get that? But that, that, that is just a, a myth that they create that that, 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 that car is going to make you happy. That's capit capitalism for you, you know? Um, so the, 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 the actual human ele element in Colombia and all the, and all the, the places that I visited, with the poor, the poorer people, is that there's a bit more unity. Um, the people help each other more. Uh, people, <laughs> the sense of community is very important because otherwise, you know, everyone is in the same struggle. Um, uh, so, in a way, you know, money, I think, just brings a lot of negative things. Uh, because that community spirit, I think, is is lost. Because everyone that's got money wants to kind of uh, hold on to it, look around, know who's going to come and steal it from me, you know. Uh, where if you don't have anything, you just uh, I don't have anything, but maybe I'll go and ask my neighbor if I can have a little bit of salt or or maybe a couple of potatoes, and I'll, and then they will do the same next day, you know. That kind of a spirit is there, and I saw. In all the, the the countries that I visited, where, but I made sure I went to the you know to the markets to where the real people live, not not just um, holiday in a in a hotel and and that's it. That's not my you know. I want to know about people. I want to know about humanity. And like I said, you know, it's time for the power of uh, of people is so strong, and I think it's it's, it's going to change. The way the way we live in, because you know. Oh, hello, my boy. You guys should say hello. Oh, hello, hello, hello. <laughs> say hello, Bamboo. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. My boy, say hello, hello, hello. So yeah, I've got to keep you company. Oh, listen. This is this is uh, as an artist, I I spend a lot of time by myself, and since I got him uh, about a year and a half ago. We have a great fun, don't we, Bumble? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. I love you too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, come on. He's just, he just came to check on me. Now he goes back to, to sleep. I was thinking of one thing. When you were in South Africa, don't Yeah. They, they say you shouldn't go to the township, but you say you wanted to go to the township. Oh. So I want to understand what was in your head at that moment that everybody was trying to frighten you not to go to the township. Uh, you were insisting. Tell me what you were thinking at that time. I, I was thinking, listen, there's nothing to be afraid of just because it's a poor area. There's, there's nothing I don't feel threatened about being around a poor community because I kind of experienced it, you know? And people read people, you know? Uh, I mean, I had an expensive camera. Um, and it's like, oh, they're going to steal you. I said, listen, I can look after myself. And I know that my my way of being about life is 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 not about I don't go around threatening people, but I have a presence, you know. I have an aura, and and that's uh, I use it. I don't. It's not I use it. I mean, it's been said before. So I just first of all, I wanted to document how the people live in the townships. That was my 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 goal, and I was gonna do it. I don't care what people were saying. You, you never been to the township, so how are you telling me I can't go to the township? But because poor people live there, 
no, I, I, I'm going to the township and I'm, that's going to be part of, I'm here in South Africa. How can I go and let that, that slip away and, and not go and, and document the real hardship and the real joy and how, they, how the, the, the poor people live? And that's what I did. Simple. And so, All right. A, a curiosity. What is really so fascinating about the way poor people live? I want you to talk about that. Well, because I live in I live in England, and and England is a very wealthy country. And uh, you know, I grew up, like I said, I wouldn't say po people would call it poverty. Yeah, probably call it poverty because I, I, you know we just we never went hungry, but we used to sleep. You know, about five of us used to sleep in one room, and you know. But then I had my grandmother, which was the most beautiful thing ever. She passed away. Um, at the, at the, 2019, I think, or no, 2020, about two years ago, at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, I feel guilty that I didn't go and say goodbye, but had I gone, she was in hospital by then, and she had lost, the, you know, the, she couldn't talk and stuff. She, um, and I thought I could go and say goodbye, but then my aunt and my sister and a few people said to me, but look, you got to come and see her. She's not really, you know, all responsive, and, and, and um, you got to come and see her there. Maybe you, she's just have the good memory that you had last year when you came to see her and I took her. You know what, For she only had about three holidays in her lifetime and it was because I took her. None of my, none of her sons or anything to, took her. Uh, and she was so grateful with me. I even I even got her, built her some stairs, well, like a ramp from her house because they never did that. And at 92, she was uh, kind of housebound. And she was so grateful for that. And actually, I took a photograph of that of that um, when she used this ramp that I built with my brother for the first time. And she looked so happy and proud that I did it. And so much so that when she died, um, I actually did a, a painting uh, of her standing on those stairs. And it's titled uh, Stairway to Heaven. And, and that's... Um, that's that's uh it's, she sits on my i can't i can't move the camera now but but she's hanging on my other side on, on my living room and she looks she looks on me 24 7. thank you for that now the work that you do um those photographs that you take and the story that you tell with it uh what do you do with it do you like take the photo to share with other people uh tell me how you yeah, then I mean, the, uh, share with people the, that's what the photo, that's what a photo documentary is about and you document things that are important to me um and show them to the to the to the the eye of the beholder which most people don't leave the comfort comfort of the the so-called secure home you know say so, look look my, the idea is like, look, look how how other people live, you know, um, see what uh, what things, how people live and how these kids are going to grow up. That brings me back to this to to, to the thing. Uh, but that's why it's called work, play, and no rest. Because if you're a kid in a poor poor country, you you have to work. I mean, I remember doing little things. My first ever job um, that I did was to these people that used to make um, like. Ice, ice lollies and you could go and, and rent from them like a little cube um, uh, what do you call it polystyrene thing and you put it there and you get they'll give you like 10 15 of, of those things on take you go and sell them and then you bring them the money and and you earn something from it that was my first ever thing and you know what the, 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 the I only did it once because I thought okay where's a good place I could go and sell this and I went to this this um, Football pitches, and um, I thought, well, after they finish working, or the people that are there, they're probably gonna they, they finish playing or something. They will probably want to buy some one of these. I, I, took, mm -hmm. yeah. I went there, and I, you know, a match was finished, and I saw this guy from that was. Let me have some. I to have one and stuff, and they all had one. Um, and then I said to him, okay, that's so much, you know. Cause I could remember how much it was. <clears throat> and the man said, oh, I don't have any money. I mean, he was a young lad. Uh, I said, I don't have any money. I said, well, if you don't have any money, why did you order this? And I, I need to pay the, you know, for them and stuff. He said, oh, just just wait. And I, and I kept saying, hey, where's the money? I, 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 you know, what am I going to do? I'm going to return these people. 
And he said, look, if you really want, uh, you, you have to come with me to my place. Like, uh, I, I got some money indoors. And I thought, well, we're going to have to do that. It's a small town anyway. So I, I followed him to, to supposedly his place. He got, and he just said, you wait here. He went into the, I mean, I'm a, I'm a, well, must have been about seven or something like that. Maybe eight, if that. And he went into, this, into his house and I'm waiting there. And it's like 10 minutes, 20 minutes. I start knocking on the door. It's like, where, where is he? And then this, this his mum or someone came out and said, no, he doesn't live here. What, what, what? Basically, he stole from me. At the end, I was crying. I was thinking, what am I going to do with these people that I have to give the money to? Um, and, um, you know, that was a really sad story. Again, I thought, what a bastard. How can you do that to a kid? Um, I'm sure that God does... And pay and, and takes it. I wouldn't be surprised if he, if he did that to, to me when I was, you know, and abused his is my trust as a kid because you're you you trust the kid. Um, I'm sure. I don't think I get the feeling that he's not alive anymore, you know, because in Colombia or in Colombia or, or, or poor country, people like that, people will take their own. Uh, if he done that to me, I'm sure that, that that was his way of being, and I'm sure he'd be dead by now. Bad thing is not good. Doing bad thing to people is not a good thing. At all, no, especially a kid, you know, an innocent kid that's trying to make a, a living, you know. Me and my friend, you know, after we walked around taking photographs, every, all the, all, everything was built in, in wood. Wooden, they're wooden little chucks, you know, the people were lived, you know, handmade <clears throat> uh, little chucks where they lived, you know, you had a whole family in one little room and they cook and live and stuff in one of these. Anyway, after walking around for quite a, a, a while, <clears throat> We came across this nursery, this little nursery, again, wooden huts and stuff, and these ladies looking after, I think it was about 10, 15 kids. Uh, they actually fenced it off so the kids didn't run off, so the parents come and drop the kids. The, the, the lucky parents that were working would drop off the kids and stuff. They didn't charge them. What they would do is bring a little bit of food and stuff so that they could all together, the people at the nursery, cook something for the kids, you know, during the day. I thought that was really beautiful. Again, um, at the time, uh, I thought it'd be great to try and get, and I actually did get my friend to, I said, listen, you should be getting your your wealthy family and friends to, to, to just get some things together so that you can bring here every week to, to, to these people so that they can cook something for the kids because they told us some days the kids had to go hungry because they didn't have, the parents didn't have any, thing to bring to cook for them. So, you know, they have to just keep the kids like that until they were, the parents will come and hopefully give them food at the end of the day, you know. I thought this is, this is, you know, what, and I, she actually got together with some some people of the family and, and stuff. Um, and I think they started dropping parcels of food every week or stuff to, to the kids and, and un, unwanted um, toys and all these things to them. Anyway, that was one of the little projects that came from that. The, the big project was that we stumbled upon, everything was built in wooden huts and stuff. Um, and we all of a sudden come to this fenced in area and there's a big building in bricks and stuff. And I thought, I wonder what is there? So we went to the door, found out there was this sign saying beautiful gate. And beautiful gate, we thought, what, what is it? He didn't say anything. Um, we, I rang the bell and then someone came to answer and, to, and, and, and to talk to us. And I said, look, I'm doing this project. I just stumbled upon your, your building. What is it that you do? And said, well, we're an orphanage. It's called Beautiful Gate in Cape Town. And people should take it up, check it up. Let me just quickly have a look at the name. of. They got a website and, and, and anyone that's looking here, it's called beautifulgatesouthafrica.org, O-R-G. Please go to the website, see the beautiful work that they do. Basically, what they, what they were doing is that um, an orphanage in the middle of the township, uh, they let us go in but not film or, or, or take photographs. Um, basically, they were looking after about 100 and something kids, and these kids were there. They had been dropped off at the gate by the parents. A lot of them were suffering from HIV from uh, AIDS. Uh, the parents didn't have the means to look after them. Um, not only were the kids with HIV, but they, they, 
they couldn't they, could, they couldn't afford the drugs even the even the orphanage at the time could not afford the drugs to keep them alive they, by then there were drugs but they couldn't afford it so all the orphanage did was just look after these kids until they passed away some of them most of them had you know hiv because that that was quite big in the in the, in the townships uh, well, it's quite strange how uh, a lot of children managed to get hiv in south africa uh, where... yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's theories about it you know the theories about the fact that it was man made mm -hmm. implanted you know to to try and which anyway uh, is that that's another anyway that is a complicated uh, story fine yeah. now what is your what is the central message of of your work uh, as we are moving towards the end of the of the story well, let me understand let me that. just finish this last bit about about the uh, Orphanage because this this one really touched me. The actual um, when we looked at the, they showed us around the whole facility and I just thought you know they had a, a sleeping area, they had like food for the kids, they had a play area for the kids, and I said so what happens to the kids when they when they pass away? And they said come come with me. We walked to the back of the of the of the actual orphanage, and in the open area you know it's, it's just green and stuff there was about at least i don't know how many hundreds of little tombs where they buried the, the kids that had passed away uh and i just saw that and i felt it i've never seen something like that you know i mean you go to cemeteries and stuff but they usually you know they're all kinds of people but this 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 whole area of just little um, souls that were laid to rest. Uh, it just felt so good. it felt sad and and like I said, you know, it's so sad that these a lot of these deaths would have, could have been prevented if they had the money to buy the drugs to keep them alive. Did it occur to you that maybe somebody could ask the question why the government of South Africa allow all those children to waste? Not just, it was a government that wasn't rich enough to provide the medicine yeah, to take that, care of the well, children. But I mean, I think that that was at that time it was a transition between you know apartheid and, and and stuff. But unfortunately, also what comes with it is the fact that power is corrupt, and a lot of these developing countries and stuff, uh, the governments are most of them become corrupt, and and you know they they would they would do anything they can to to put and get money to the Swiss bank accounts and to, you know, to give it away to the rich people rather than help the actual poor people to progress, you know, even sometimes. And I, I, I thought that's really sad. Uh, but it's the way it is. Uh, but, you know, it can be changed. You just have to conscientize people about these things. And, and you know, unity can is a very powerful thing. And you can demand you know, uh, the rights of living and the rights of, um, you know, human human rights. What message do you want to pass across uh, with your work? What, what is the essence of your work? What is but, the message? Look, the, come, going back to the, to the thing, that what we did uh, with the published book was um, we donated 20% of the, of the, of the sales to, to this orphanage, to, to this beautiful gate, and another orphanage in Abankai, Peru that uh, I met um, some, some uh, Lucy and, and a friend. They went to Peru to, uh, on, on holiday. And I think on holiday, no, they went to work as volunteers and they set up this little, um, with an orphan they worked in an orphanage and they basically uh, wanted to teach these kids a trade. And so we did a bit of funding for that. Unfortunately, uh, I mean, this is about 15 years ago. When was the book published? Let me just double check. Um, unfortunately, at the time, being my own, um, what's the word? Uh, it was published in 2004. So ne that's nearly 20 years now, 19 years. Um, I didn't have the experience to actually market the book and what have you. But, uh, but the one thing that, uh, so we couldn't generate as much revenue as we wanted to. In fact, we lost, lost if you for argument said a lot of the money we invested in doing the whole project and creating it they were being stored somewhere and because i went away and I didn't, I didn't have the money to pay for their storage when i came out i tried to look for the books the book had disappeared the person that i lost the the number of the person that was holding them uh and they, these people just actually went and sold the books very cheaply and uh and um 
And they're now being sold on Amazon and everything, not by me, by, by whoever bought them. Um, and uh, they've been sold for like seven pounds, ten pounds. But they were they were actually supposed to be selling at twenty five pound when, because it's you know it's a hundred and fifty uh, table size um, coffee table size book. They were being sold for twenty twenty pounds, and and twenty percent was donated, being going to be donated to these two orphanages. But unfortunately, like I said, you know, I I, I owe about thirty or forty of them, which I'm keeping as a as a as a little trophy, because, you know, now that I'm, my name is becoming quite big with my arts and stuff, um, I would tell the story. I mean, I actually went to the police, reported it and stuff, and they record they couldn't do anything. They couldn't prove it. They couldn't. I said, well, how can you not prove it? I got the, all the receipts and everything that, that I produced the book. is my book. And uh, um, and they said that they couldn't prove that they couldn't trace the person and, blah, 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 and now that they're being sold. Anyway. That's that's the sad story about the book. But the, the good thing about the book is that one day I received a letter saying uh, from the British Library, and they said we have found um, about your book, uh, and we would um, invite you to give us. Uh, we will want to store six of your books if you can give. If you don't, you don't actually. They don't pay for them, but they said if you are willing to. We will have six of your books in, in in the British the British Library, which is I think is one of the biggest library in the world. Um, they basically uh, uh, keep one at the library outside, so people can see it. Uh, one or two, uh, and two in a storage space uh, in an archive downstairs, and two in a vault somewhere. So basically, my book is going to be there for thousands of years until unless something happens to the British Library that, that is a great that is a great achievement thank you for that now what would be your final thought here very uh, briefly to conclude the conversation yeah, yeah my final thought would be that that people um, should I'm look most people I think have the, the humanity issue on it but most people are too preoccupied with with this uh, rat race that man has created and how to achieve yeah uh, to aim for gold, aim for money, aim for thing. I think people should step back and and see what they can do to actually help change the world. Um, uh, very briefly, just now with my with my with my actual uh, work, I, I painted my grandmother, and and throughout the pandemic, I, I started painting a series of of the elderly, and I've done seven so far, seven paintings of elderly people. Because I think they they are like the kids that are in my book. They um, tend to be, especially in the societies like this one, they are isolated, uh, discarded by by members of the family, and but a lot of them uh, just live alone, and and people don't care for them. And I thought I'm going to try and do something with that, uh, and that's um, that's what I, I what I'm doing with the with the project, and it's it's it's, it's gathering momentum. We're going to try and do a, a campaign with images of uh, their paintings by the way and and you can have a look let me invite the people the people that are watching my uh website is julio and then c e s a r t s dot com so julio cesars dot com uh, i'm sure um eh, obehi will will write it on 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 where we you know where we talked about the, the project because uh, people should have a look uh, like I said, everything I do now, even with with the the chokers, which is called Carmen Sita's tribe, and and we can list that as well because, like I said, that is going to be. I I haven't created the website, but I got the domain yesterday, and I will be creating the website for it. That you know, remember, this is going to employ lots of people that are marginalised in Colombia, and that and that's part of that project. Uh, the old people's project, and I want to revive. Hopefully, this is the last thing I'm going to say. Hopefully, it'd be great if I don't know who, who's watching this and stuff, but wouldn't it be great to actually try and trace some of these children from the book and see where their lives are at the moment? I think that would be a great, a, a great project to do, and see what we can do. Uh, you know, um, I'm sure if we were to put some of these the, these photographs on social media and stuff i'm sure we can trace some of them but 
we need funding for that, and it'll be great if uh, if someone. Everything needs funding, of of uh, course. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> but, uh, but you know, I can, you need money. I can only I can only do as much as I'm doing for the time being. I will be in November. I will be going to uh, to the Art Basel in Miami because I've been selected to exhibit at one of the exhibitions. The Art Basel is like the whole art world descends on Miami. And that's where I'm going to be in November. I'm going to be painting on the streets with, with Bamboo, my dog. I go, I'll be exhibiting in one of the, in one of the, it's called the, the Bini Alley, uh, Art Basel, uh, no, Baywood Bini Alley, uh, in Wainwood. Uh, basically, that we can list as well so people can see what, what, what it's going to be. And um, if, if you ever spot me anywhere around the world, or if you want to get in touch, uh, do it through my website or, or, my, or my, even simpler, julio at juliocsarts.com. Email me or, or something, or even on, on my Instagram, uh, juliocsartist8.com. Um, sorry, at juliocsartist. Thank you so much, uh, Julius. It, uh, it has been a pleasure listening to you and having your story here. Of course, that is why we are here. We are here to share the story of people who are doing great things there. If you enjoy this podcast, make sure you subscribe so you never miss any of our future episodes. Rate and review Obehead Podcast and share with your friends who might need it. I remain Obehead Ewafo. Thank you so much for listening and talk to you in the next episode.